All right, it's time to talk about politics, crime, and Israel, but not in the way it usually happens on the internet. So let's get started. Cheers. Welcome back, everybody, to me talking about books and one book in specific today, and that is um, Maror by Lavi Tidar, which came out last year, got a bit of a buzz in, you know, serious newspapers, and then no one on Booktube talked about it. And finally, earlier this year, the audiobook came out, and I listened to it, and I wanted to talk about it, and I even got a thumbnail made for it, and then I didn't do it. But then I reread the book, and now I'm finally ready to talk about it, because later this week, there will be the next one, which is Arama, and I want to talk about that one as well. So, here we are. We'll do the usual thing, which is I'll give you a quick synopsis when I tell you why you should really go and read this book. Then I'll have a quick sip of beer, and then we'll talk about themes and stuff that I think need to be talked about or make this book so fantastic in a more detailed way. There might be some spoilers in here, but since a lot of this is based on history, I don't think those spoilers matter too much, so even if you don't want to read the book or feel like not reading it right away, you might learn something from the spoilers. If you're not too sensitive to spoilers, at least I'll try to keep, keep you know, the really big surprises down there as well. But, you know, you'll know when it happens. So, that's what we're going to do today, so uh, let's get started, right? All right, so what is Maror? Maror is Lavi Tidar's first, well, seriously marketed um, literary fiction, historical fiction novel, um, compared to a lot of sci-fi and fantasy that I've talked about on this channel before in detail, because I'm a big fan. This one, however, is, as I said, a historical novel, maybe also a crime novel. Um, it's based in Israel and covers a time from, like, the, the, the 70s or the 1970s to the early 2000s. And it does so as a series of overlapping um, crime uh, fiction stories or shorter stories that kind of interlock because there's overlapping characters and so forth, covering all that time in front of the backdrop of Israeli history and world history during these uh, times. Each individual, you know, part of the novel is more or less its own story. Most of these are really good. Most of these uh, follow, you know, different aspects or different facets of the crime, thriller, whatever you want to call it, kind of genre from, you know, hard-boiled, noir style to more action, adventure <laughs> almost style. The whole gamut of that um, genre is represented in these different aspects, but throughout the whole thing there is a bigger question at stake, and that is, of course, what is the soul of a nation? And that's kind of where the whole thing goes. So even if you haven't, you know, don't know that much about Israeli history um, at this point, you can take this as a, you know, start, starting point. I don't want to say a lodestar because, you know, but, you know, you can take this as a guide and then use um, the, the internet and other aspects to learn more about a country's history that goes beyond what you usually learn or know about the state of Israel and its history. So it does do some educational work, but it also, and first and foremost, is a really entertaining, really well-written collection of crime stories that build one larger narrative about, well, all kinds of crime and politics and people that are, well, mostly people. It's a brilliant book. You should go and read it and you'll learn a lot and maybe learn even more than you expected. So go do it for fuck's sake. It's it's definitely, I don't give stars, but it's certainly a five-star book if I would give stars. And you should go and read it now. And I'll have a bit of a beer instead and then we'll talk about why I think it's so brilliant. All right. You done with the reading? Perfect. Let's talk about why I think this book is important, what kind of stuff it does, and where it fits in. And we'll start talking about the idea of world fiction, or fiction set in, well, places that are not America or Western Europe, which is, for people like me, still sort of, well, world fiction. There's obviously a problem with calling it that um, in that way because it still has that built-in direction and hierarchy, but we'll go with it for now. And it's been around for a while. Obviously, the book market has become more international, and that's a great thing. And it does do something that I think is important to look at. There's another aspect here, which I would call underbelly fiction or underbelly history. Um, it's also something that's been around for a while, and I think it's slightly different from what you might call crime fiction, where we'll go next. And, you know, big examples for that might be A Brief History of Seven Killings by Marlon James, 
or White Tiger, which I forgot the name of the author at this point because I'm bad with, you know, names that are not German or English. Anyway, um, this is sort of something that people have read a bit more. It's, it's a younger thing and it's tied to the post-colonialist, uh, post-colonial movement in a lot of ways and anti-imperialist movement. I think that's an important aspect to this. Why do I think these stories are interesting or important? See, underbelly history is another thing that, like in historiography, we've only started to do for the last couple of decades, where we look at the parts of society that are usually left out. You know, the criminals, the poor, possibly, depending on how far you want to go with that, your laborers, the non-owning classes, so to speak, and how their life lives can give us an insight into how the world actually works or how a country actually works. Always dealing with that big question, what's, well, that soul of a nation, and we'll come back to that. See, so that's something we've started to do in um, historiography and in history, but we've also started doing it in fiction, and that's where the post-colonial angle kind of comes in. See, um, even after the end or, well, of official colonialism and parts of official imperialism during the 20th century, images of certain countries that have been incredibly influenced by colonialism and not in a good way, have often been, well, mostly influenced by that experience of colonialism and the past of colonialism. The image that a lot of people have of, say, India or, say, well, Jamaica in the, state, in the name of, well, Brief History of Seven Killings, are influenced by their time as part of the British Empire. On the other hand, the image a lot of people have of Israel, the state of Israel, is also very much influenced by the colonial and imperial history that led to the foundation of this state. We'll not go into arguments of politics, current politics here, but no matter what you, where your stance is, the results well, the existence of Israel is the result of, well, centuries of colonialism and imperialism in that era, in that area. So what I, my point here is, is that these <clears throat> countries and the image we out here in the privileged West and the colonizing and imperial uh, countries or former colonizing and former imperial countries, depending on where you live, have is very much influenced by that past. And that does not necessarily reflect the actual countries or the actual image these countries or the actual identity or spirit or soul or character of these countries. Now, part of that is obviously also that these countries um, have a vested interest, or the, at least the elites in those countries have a vested interest in creating a different or similar narrative to profit their nation from. So the image that the current governments of India project outwards is very different from probably the lived experience of people in India. Same goes for Jamaica. And same obviously also goes for Israel. Maybe in particular very much for Israel, which has probably one of the most polarized public images in the world, and really actually based on, you know, in-depth knowledge of um, Israeli history, which is one of these interesting things. I recently talked with uh, some friends that I kind of bludgeoned into reading uh, Maror <laughs> about it, and a common complaint was that they didn't know anything about the events described in the, well, historical background of this novel. And I'm like, I'm not an expert on Israeli history, but I kind of knew at least some of these things. So, obviously, there is a need for these kinds of books, and that's sort of the background or the field of literature where I would situate Maror. It tells a story about the lived experience or a possible experience of living in Israel from people that are forced to live there and are trying to make their way there that are not necessarily the people in charge of the country. And that, I think, is an important, uh, valuable lens to look through. Which obviously leads to making this something of a crime fiction. See, crime fiction is one of the big genres of the 20th century and has a, developed a lot of different forms, subgenres, um, tropes, and so forth. And the advantage of using these is that you can say things by deliberately deploying these tropes to, um, well, manipulate an image, while also already having, you know, structures that a reader that is maybe... Um, coming into a new place, a new setting, can, you know, latch onto and focus on these other aspects. Another part is, of course, that crime fiction is, well, like all fiction, but maybe more explicitly so, inherently political. 
just as, say, horror fiction, because it usually represents um, the greater fears of a society at a specific moment in time. And that's why um, choosing different forms and subforms of the crime fiction, you know, the smuggling, the murder investigation, the high octane um, action sequence of the first part, why all of these are, well, ways or lenses that we can apply and that allow the reader to uh, then, well, learn something more about the feeling, the atmosphere, the sense of being in that place that Maror delivers. I think it does all of this in a very powerful way and it's a, as I said, like it makes it more accessible to people that have no experience um, of being there. Well, once again, all of that is, as I have said, in search of one question, and that is, what is the soul of a nation? What's what's a place? What's it mean to be there, to the people that live there? And this is something that um, Maror does tackle through the ages, because, you know, places change, people change, and one example, or one way you can do this is, of course, by having a character show up in these books that we rarely if ever get an inside perspective of this, in this case, being Cohen, the uh, chief inspector. Now, there's obviously parallels to the term Cohen in uh, Jewish religion. Uh, it's also born on the day of the uh, one announcement of the existence of the State of Israel in 1948. Um, so symbolism is heavy on this one. <laughs> but also, his character and his views change over time, and it's something that we see through these different episodes from the 70s through the 80s, 90s, and so forth, how, you know, these things change, because Israel as a country historically has had one migration after the other, and each of these, they, they built different layers, and they kind of show oftentimes, in a way, they parallel like a lot of ideas that we have as humans when we grow through life. It starts out with a highly idealist, idealistic um, background with the kibbutzim movement and a decidedly leftist, socialist um, movement. And then over time, it moves into a more pragmatic way of looking at things or focusing heavily on survival through, you know, the wars of the 60s and 70s, for example. And then moving into a more pragmatist uh, view uh, that the goal is not so much creating a better world, but just keeping the one that you have, keeping stability in a lot of ways. And that's, that's something that goes and moves throughout this story over time with these different characters. First, you try to solve the problem, then you run up against things that... Um, restrict your agency in a lot of ways and um, move within these constraints, try to use these constraints to at least keep the thing that you decide is the most important part, which is well, survival and stability. And we can see this while throughout the entire thing. Obviously, you know, new characters show up, new opportunities show up, sometimes, you know, history moves on, and you can see, in fact, even, you know, Hope blossoming up again. You also see people that from the beginning maybe have been part of that society, of that process. There has, there's a dark side. There are, well, not to put a final point on it, criminals who mostly look into enriching themselves and through that endanger, um, well, maybe the stability of the entire thing, but also create more, well, outside dangers, um, more hatred, <laughs> division, while other people maybe change over time and hope for, for better futures. And I think that's something that you see throughout this history, how these moods change. Because one of the big questions that, you know, comes with every nation, but probably with one that is, well, fairly young and recent in that regard, is the question like, where are we going? What's the goal of this? What's the vision? And, you know, the Kibbutzim had a very clear vision for that. <laughs> Other people have maybe the vision of just stability, which is not so much a vision for the future, but more like um, at least a minimum thing that everyone kind of can agree upon. And then there's other people who think that are cynical and think that the nation is just there to be plundered and be used for personal enrichment. These people obviously also exist. And then there's outside influences on other countries that want to do stuff with that nation, use it for their agendas, you know, maybe to uh, support or the, the fight against communism, or maybe, you know, use it to smuggle drugs. There's a lot of international interests that always come up because international politics, global politics, are like that. And throughout that, there is always that question, is there hope? Because each new generation kind of has that hope. And that brings us to the next interesting aspect of this novel, which is its heavy reliance on cultural aspects. 
Because one thing in which um, the culture or the soul of a nation usually finds a way to express itself is its current culture. The lyrics, the, the, the musics people create, the art people create. These are often expressions um, of the things that are on our minds, on our souls. And throughout this story, there's a heavy, well, you know, usage of contemporary art of each generation of each time to kind of build that thing. Just as there is a heavy reliance on creating or recreating or portraying different aspects of the country of Israel, places, the sense of place is incredibly strong in this. Like, I've, I've only been to Israel twice and yeah, I've been to Haifa. It feels like that. It's, it's, it's incredibly powerful in that regard to give that tangible, that feeling that, you know, these places connect up to a point to a national character, to, well, I hate that word, but like to the soul of a nation. These things connect to that. And that, that is empowered here. And that obviously leads, because this is a political novel, just like every novel is political, this leads to the final, final end of this story, which kind of makes it really hard to read and leaves me baffled at a point, which is the focus on the current state of things, which obviously the novel stops in the early 2000s, but still, the where to and why are we here, where we are. <clears throat> One key point here, at least for the current generation, I guess um, the generation, my generation, or maybe the slightly older generation, that point is um, the mid-90s and the um, death of, or the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, or, and the failure of the Oslo process, a peace process. Because that, once again, is a moment where there is a vision for the future, a hope for the future. And the doubling of that assassination with the fatalities at the Arad Rock Festival, um, that doubling, of that death of a generation, that death of hope of a generation, of, of a future, that just leads to despair and cynicism and violence, whether it's the mindless violence after the assassination of Rabin um, in, the, in this portrait here in the streets, or whether it's the mindless corruption, violence, and egotism that kind of fuels um, that frustrated uh, cop Abi um, um, in the first part, um, whether that's that, or probably, possibly also things that are still happening now, that's the result of that violent death of hope and vision. And so you can read this book, and both as an explanation or an attempt as an, at an explanation or analysis of the soul of a nation, or also as an invitation to come up with alternatives, with new futures, with new visions, and where they can be, because, you know, just stability might just not be enough. And that, I think, is what makes this book so powerful, that it shows the need for dreams, that it shows the need to express yourself and do, well, come up with ideas of where to go, because just staying alive leads to despair and fatalism and cynicism. And all of that makes Maror such a powerful novel. You'll learn a lot about Israeli nature, you'll learn a lot about Israeli history, the dark bits and the good bits, and you are left with that question, is that enough? Where can it go? And that's up to us. Well, not to me, obviously, necessarily, but that's up to people. And leaving it that open, I think, makes it a very powerful story. I personally really appreciated the book. I'm really looking forward to the next one. I hope you've read the book by now, or I hope I can't convince you to actually read the book, because, yeah, you should. And, uh, yeah, thanks for listening to me talking about it. Um, uh, yeah, I'll see you in the next one. If you want to support me, like, subscribe, do the things. Otherwise, um, still thanks for watching it. I'll see you in the next one, and until then, cheers.